Babylon. The counterpart to Zion is Babylon, identified in the scriptures as the world. It is described just as fully, clearly, and vividly in the scriptures as Zion is, and usually in direct relationship to it. Just as surely as Zion is to be established, Babylon is to be destroyed. Babylon is not to be converted, she's to be destroyed. Today's world is the substance of an idol which waxes old and shall perish in Babylon, even Babylon the great which shall fall, TNC 54, paragraph 3. For after today comes the burning and I will not spare any that remain in Babylon, TNC 51, paragraph 7. Babylon is nothing but the inverse image of Zion. Babylon is a state of mind, as Zion is, with its appropriate environment. Babylon is described fully in Revelation chapter 7, she is rich, luxurious, immoral, full of fornications, merchants, riches, delicacies, sins, merchandise, gold, silver, precious stones, pearls, fine linens, purples, silks, scarlets, thighing wood, all manner of vessels, ivory, precious wood, brass, iron, marble, and so on. She is a giant delicatessen, full of wine, oil, fine flour, we. A perfume counter with cinnamon, odors, ointments, and frankincense. A market with beasts and sheep. It reads like a guide to a modern supermarket or department store and it is all for sale. In her power and affluence she is unchallenged. Babylon is number one. She dominates the world. Her king is equated to Lucifer, who says, I will be like the Most High. Isaiah 6, paragraph 6. And when Babylon falls, all the world is involved. Nephi used similar typology when he described the two churches, Babylon is a type. It is the world and worldly power, where everyone and everything has a price. The Lord has called His people to go out from Babylon, and go out from among the nations, even from Babylon, from the midst of wickedness, which is spiritual Babylon, TNC 58, paragraphs 1 and 2. Out of Zion and out of Jerusalem will go the law and the teachings that will constitute the effort, the government, the society, and the culture that's going to finally free itself from the toxic influences and the corrupt traditions that have been passed down from generation to generation, being influenced all the way back to Babylon. That's why the prophecies of John talk about the fall of Babylon the Great. Because the head of gold is still with us. The Babylonian influence remains with us still in our banking, in our profit motives, in our culture, in our education, in our false ideas about what's important and what's not, in our desire for power, and wealth, and influence. All of those things remain with us still today. And they corrupt everything. They corrupt business, they corrupt governments, they corrupt churches. They corrupt society. Everyone is vying with one another to gain influence, power, and in turn, wealth and the acclamation of this world. And it all goes back to Babylon. Which is why John prophesies the fall, not of every one of these components of the great image that Nebuchadnezzar saw, but he goes right to the head. Because as soon as you destroy the head, everything else is going to unravel. And he prophesies about the destruction of Babylon, the head of gold that holds sway over all else. Baptism An ordinance that is intended to communicate light and truth into the mind of the individual, not merely to fulfill an initiation rite. It is meant to enlighten. The ordinance is performed by following the instructions taught by Christ in 3 Nephi 5, paragraph 8. One must be put under the water and then come forth again out of the water. The purpose of baptism is to follow Christ's example. See John 6, paragraph 29 and 9, paragraph 8. It symbolizes the death of the old man of sin and the resurrection into a new life in Christ. See Romans 1, paragraph 25. This symbol cannot be mirrored by sprinkling. It must involve immersion. One is placed below the surface of the water, in the same way the dead are buried below ground. The breath of life is cut off while under the water and restored anew when coming forth again out of the water. The officiator, having obtained power and authority from God is the one who immerses and then brings the recipient up out of the water. See Preserving the Restoration, page 512 and TNC 175, paragraphs 26-32. 
performing this ordinance puts the officiator in the role of the Lord, who holds the keys of death and resurrection. See Revelation 1, paragraph 6, and 2 Nephi 1, paragraph 6. Christ prescribes the exact words to be used in the ordinance. Authorization comes from Jesus Christ, but the ordinance is performed in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. The power to do the ordinance comes from the Son, but the ordinance is in the name of each member of the Godhead. Though they are one, they occupy different roles and hold different responsibilities. In this fallen world, God communicates with man primarily through the Holy Ghost. However, when a person rises up through the merits of Jesus Christ to receive him as a minister, they are living in a terrestrial law and inherit terrestrial blessings. When he has finished his preparations with the person and can bring them to the Father, the person is brought to a point where the Father can accept and acknowledge them as a son. They are then begotten of the Father, C.T. and C. 86, paragraphs 3-4. The ordinance of baptism symbolizes some eternal truths regarding the plan of salvation. In the very moment the ordinance is performed, there is a renewal in the symbols of life, innocence, forgiveness, and resurrection. The earth itself is blessed by baptism, as well as other ordinances. The earth itself is defiled when the ordinances are not kept exactly as prescribed. See Isaiah 7, paragraph 1 and Genesis 5, paragraph 12. The earth knows that God ordained the ordinances of heaven and earth. As regular and reliable as the movements of the sun and moon are, so too should the ordinances of the Lord be kept in their appointed ways. See Jeremiah 13, paragraph 10. The heavens and earth rejoice when the ordinances are kept. They symbolize eternal hope, man's acceptance of God's plan, and a presence of righteousness in a fallen world. Mankind's participation in ordinances is vital to his or her own renewal and the renewal of all creation through redemption of each individual soul. The baptism ordinance, like all those that follow after, is intended not merely to fulfill an initiation rite. It is intended to communicate light and truth into the mind of the individual who is performing and receiving the ordinance. It is meant to enlighten. In the same way that Christ restored life to Lazarus and commanded him to come forth, Baptism allows all to rise from the tomb of sin, which imprisons them, into the new life awaiting them in Christ. John 7, paragraph 6. See also the glossary entry, Rebaptism. Baptism of Fire and the Holy Ghost. A sign of redemption, purification, and holiness that is included in the gate for entering into God's presence. The baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost as taught by Christ in the doctrine of Christ from 2 Nephi 13, paragraph 3, is given without man's involvement, comes from heaven, and is promised by both the Father and the Son. God is a consuming fire, and those who enter into His presence must be able to endure that fire. See Hebrews 1, paragraph 57, and Deuteronomy 2, paragraph 5. Without the capacity to do so, a person would be consumed by the flames. See Leviticus 2, paragraph 25. The fire and the Holy Ghost are given as a sign to the recipient that they may know it is safe for them to enter into God's presence and not be consumed. The baptism of fire purges and removes sin, and its effect is to permit one to speak with the tongue of angels. 2 Nephi 13, paragraph 2. Nephi cautions that once this gift has been conferred, if one should deny me Christ, it would have been better for you that ye had not known me. 2 Nephi 13, paragraph 3. This process comes after repentance and baptism. It comes to show all things and to teach the peaceable things of the kingdom. TNC 23, paragraph 2. To speak with the tongue of angels means you are elevated, your knowledge and your inspiration reckons from heaven itself. You have been elevated by fire, which purges sins and purifies. In effect, you receive holiness through the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit. This in turn makes your own spirit holy. Your spirit or your ghost is within you, connected to heaven to such a degree through this process that you are in possession of a Holy Spirit or a Holy Ghost within you. Recipients of the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost receive the Father's testimony of the Son. And thus will the Father bear record of me. 3 Nephi 5, Paragraph 9 
you cannot receive this baptism and not have a testimony given to you by the Father of the Son. Beast The prophets do not declare that they saw a beast or beasts, but that they saw the image or figure of a beast. They did not see an actual bear or lion but the images or figures of those beasts. The translation should have been rendered image instead of beast in every instance where beasts are mentioned by the prophets. But John saw the actual beast in heaven, to show to John that that being did actually exist there. When the prophets speak of seeing beasts in their visions, they saw the images, the types to represent certain things and at the same time they received the interpretation as to what those images or types were designed to represent. Become as a little child. Except you are converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 9, paragraph 10. According to Christ's words, returning to the mind of a child is necessary as a precondition for all to be able to enter his kingdom. The chief characteristic of childhood is inquisitiveness and the search for greater understanding, see Mosiah 1, paragraph 17. Repentance is not likely unless a person is willing to undergo a change to become more childlike in perspective and attitude. This is more than just an analogy or good advice. It is a prerequisite. It is the only way you can inherit the kingdom of God. Children are open to change and willing to learn. They welcome new ideas, for all ideas are new to them. The world is new to them. They feel their ignorance and are anxious to fill it with information and understanding. They know they are unable to cope with the world they live in unless they obtain more understanding than they have. They relentlessly search to know more. On the other hand, adults believe they already know something and are unwilling to receive more. Adults learn disciplines of study and then think the gospel should be viewed by the tools of the scholar. To the economist, all of the gospel appears to be financial. To the philosopher, all of the gospel appears to be dialectic. To the lawyer it is a legal system. But the gospel is separate from the understanding of men. It requires us to surrender our arrogance and foolishness and come as a child to learn anew everything about life and truth. This is why the gospel always begins with creation, informs of the fall, and preaches the atonement. We must repent because the foundation of accepting new truth begins with the realization that we're not getting anywhere by what we've already done. We need to abandon old ways and begin anew. Until we are open to the new truths offered through the gospel, we can't even start the journey. We're headed in the wrong direction and don't even know it. First, we need to realize our direction is wrong. Then, stop going that way. When we turn to the new direction, we've begun repenting. From repentance comes light and truth. At first, just turning to face the new direction is a great revelation. But you've not seen anything until you walk in that direction for a while. As you move toward the light and receive more, the world itself changes meaning and nothing you used to think important remains important. Becoming as a little child, or repenting, must precede baptism if you are to be saved. Otherwise, you cannot receive these things or, in other words, you cannot accept the new truths and perspectives the gospel will require you to know and accept. Unless these steps are taken you cannot inherit the kingdom of God because only such people will be able to enter. Teachable. Open. Willing to receive more. Able to endure difficulties as a result of the changes that come to them. Patient. Submissive to God. And eager to learn more. Not arrogant. Not trying to fit the new truths into your existing framework of false notions. Not resisting truth and arguing against it. Not proud or boastful, secure in your own salvation. Not holding a testimony that you will be saved while others around you will be lost because they do not believe as you do. How few there will be who find it. Most people are simply unwilling to repent. They have such truth as they are willing to receive already, and want nothing more. See Doctrine of Christ. Becoming One All are to become one with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It is a distant goal, to be accomplished after being added upon for a long time. To become one will be to reach the end of a long journey. All can be given promises of that end. All can receive covenants that will bring them there. 
but arrival will be a great while after they have passed through the veil for it is not all to be comprehended in this world. Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, pages 348. One may be initiated, but to enter in will be a great work to learn our salvation and exaltation even beyond the grave. The ideal of being one with the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is, for mankind, something that is distant, to be sought after, to be kept before them, but not to be obtained until some time later. But to be one with each other is another matter. Being one is required for Zion to return. Zion is required for the Lord to dwell among His people again. He is going to return to a Zion, no matter how few may be involved. He will come even if only two or three gather in His name, see Matthew 9, paragraph 14. Zion may be small, but it will nonetheless, be Zion before He can visit with her. Do not watch for iniquity in each other. If you do, you will not get an endowment, for God will not bestow it on such, TNC 117, paragraph 4. Belief in Christ necessarily means belief in the Father. To believe Christ is to accept His message of the Father's primacy and authority. One sees in these three members of the Godhead a full establishment of interconnected roles and responsibilities. The Father ordains the plan. It is He who presides. The Son implements the plan. It is He who makes the required sacrifice to save us. The Holy Ghost activates the plan. It is the fire of the Holy Ghost which makes new, cleanses, and perfects the man's understanding. These three are one and united. They provide mankind with the possibility for salvation and exaltation. Belief Understanding and accepting true doctrine, see 3 Nephi 7, paragraph 4. Belief comes after mere hope, meaning desire, and is based upon the conviction a proposition is true. There is a difference between belief and faith and between faith and knowledge. It is a spectrum. At one end there is desire, and it is then followed by belief. By degrees this belief grows into faith, and faith can progress by degrees into knowledge. Knowledge is at the other end of the spectrum. Belief is a step toward faith. Belief can come from study and from trusting others. Belief can be very weak, or it can be a strongly held conviction. In the Book of Mormon, Jacob makes a startling promise for those who live when the destruction begins preliminary to the cleansing of the world before the Lord returns. He says, None will he destroy that believeth in him. And they that believe not in him shall be destroyed, both by fire, and by tempest, and by earthquakes, and by bloodsheds, and by pestilence, and by famine, 2 Nephi 5, paragraph 5. This amazing promise is predicated on believing in him. This requires us to understand what the word believe means in the parlance of the Book of Mormon. Those who believe in Him know and accept correct doctrine, or the truth, about Him. Those who do not know and will not accept correct doctrine or the truth have dwindled in unbelief. They do not believe in Him. They may have religion, may belong to churches, may be active in all their observances, but they are not in possession of belief in Him. Instead they accept for doctrines the commandments of men and their hearts are far from him. They teach false and vain things. As a result, they neither enter into the kingdom nor suffer those who are entering to go in. This includes those who, though they are humble followers of Christ, are nevertheless led that in many instances they do err in doctrine, see 2 Nephi 12, paragraph 2. There will be many who are destroyed who will be quite surprised by it. They will complain that they have prophesied in Christ's name, have cast out devils in His name, and done many wonderful works, but they do not know Christ, and therefore, never did believe in Him, see Matthew 3, paragraphs 47-48. If you are one of those who believe in Him, and who will not dwindle in unbelief, will not accept the commandments of men as doctrine, but will take the Spirit for your guide, then Jacob promises that Christ will not destroy you. The rest he will destroy. To believe in Him is to accept, study, contemplate, and ponder His teachings. It is not to just go along with the group, but to rise up from one's position and awaken from one's slumber. It is to grow into knowledge about Him. Belief leads to faith and faith to knowledge. But the process is initiated by one's belief and correct understanding of His teachings, see the lectures on faith.